All right, let's take a few minutes to pray. We're going to ask the Lord to bless and help in this nation. Uh, you know, the voter fraud is a real problem. I just was reading some various articles on the issue. Of course, you know what's going on in Broward County in Florida. <clears throat> Excuse me, in Florida again. What's frustrating is you'd think something would have been done about that, right? You know what I mean? I mean, what's the deal here? How can the same people that were in control of that mess last time continue to be in place and continuing to do the same kinds of things? It's just, it's frustrating, I know, but listen, I'll be dealing with that in the message this evening a little more thoroughly and directly, but we're going to pray about it right now. I read in Georgia, they have a county where, or, or a precinct, where they had 670 and some change ballots in a precinct that had 280 voters. How does that happen? And you remember the stories we got from California. They're kind of suppressed right now, but I'm sure that's going on still. But where they had areas, precincts, where there were, again, more ballots than voters in, in the precinct. That's just, it's a common thing. And you know what's really weird? I hate, almost hate to say this in a way. I mean, I don't, but I don't know how to explain my feelings of, of ambivalence in the matter. It's just so weird to, to have to say that it's always the Democrats. Why is that? It has to be the Russians. I just don't understand what it's about. And by the way, this is not, you know, Republican, Democrat. I'm just, it's just weird how what's happened in our country is these two parties, the two primary parties, Republican and Democrat. Let me back up a little bit and say that, you know, my dad was a Democrat all of my life as I was growing up. And it was a very different party then than it is now. It's just so different. I mean, I didn't agree with certain basic principles in the Democratic Party, but I had respect for a lot of their concerns. I just didn't agree with their approach to those concerns. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You know, so my dad and I kind of parted ways politically. We never had a knockdown, drag out fight, though, about it. Because it wasn't about those sorts of things. It was about, well, how do we, how do we address the issue of poverty? And how do we provide homes and, you know, at affordable prices? And how do, we, you know, what's the, the path, what's the path we take to get to a mutually agreed to objective? That's what it was about. It was just different ideas about how we get to a mutually agreed objective. Now, we have different objectives. It's like one group wants to take the country out from under God, wants to secularize the whole thing to the point of saying the Christians have nothing to say and have no part in anything. They want to go someplace that, well, that's just a whole different place. They have a whole different direction. Now, get hold of this as I conclude this particular little Issachar report and we pray together. What's concerning is that the Republican Party has increasingly become more and more the home of Christian conservatism. All right? The Democratic Party has become increasingly the home of liberal Christianity or Christian liberalism, modernism, all that kind of stuff. The fight between conservative Christianity and liberal Christianity goes way back into the 20s. And it's weird how the political landscape has developed to the place now where more and more, or increasingly, Christian conservatives find themselves almost pushed into the Republican Party as the only place to go to find any hope of making any kind of influence on, on the country. Um, the Republicans are not perfect. Or is that, is that a shock to anybody? I mean, there are a lot of strange things that go on in the Republican Party. I have an ongoing battle with the California GOP. Just ongoing. You know, they don't like me and I don't like them. Although we've gotten a little friendlier lately. I just don't, you know, they want to put Meg Whitman up, an abortion uh, supporter as governor. They, they're constantly asking me to compromise core values to advance a politi the, the interests of a political party. I'm not going to do that. It's not happening. So I have that conflict with, so my, what I'm trying to get around to is say, I, it's not like I'm all GOP. I'm not. I'm Jesus Christ. Well, no, I'm not, but he is. But, <laughs> wow. Talk about a faux pas. 
man, I, I am for Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I'm, I belong to Him. My vote belongs to Him. My life belongs to Him. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't, I'll never dig myself out of that mess. But anyway, you get my point. And uh, so it's not about political party with me. I'm just being objective. Just step back and look at this. Here's what's happened. The party on the left has become the party of deviancy, the derelict. It has. It's become that party. And here's what's even more fundamentally concerning. The core values of those who populate the Republican Party, not the Republican Party, but the core values of the people who populate that party now because of this phenomenon that has developed over the last four or five decades, really. They have a set of values that are very distinct from how the values have shaped on the left. They just have a different value system. It's in their world, it's okay to cheat if that's what you need to do to win in order to get the power you need to advance the causes they believe in. That's a value over here. That's not just, that's the way they do things. These people defend what they're doing. They think they're on a righteous mission. They think it's right to get in your face and scream at you. They think it's right to, to use manipulation and uh, intimidation. They, they think they are righteous to do that. Well, this group over here, that's why you're seeing this. There's all this voter fraud thing that goes on. I'm sure there are some uh, Republicans who cheat. What do you figure? Of course. But the people who populate this party in the main have a diametrically opposite value system from the people that in the main populate this party. It's just gone that way now. I don't know how anybody who is a biblical Christian can feel comfortable in the Democratic Party today. I just don't know how you can do that. And that brings me to what I'm going to say next. And it kind of segues into the message and where the message goes. My friends, a lot of this has developed because many churches stopped preaching the gospel about 50 years ago. They just simply stopped preaching the gospel. They're preaching a kind of watered down version of, if you want to go to heaven, repeat after me. Repentance is no longer preached. Repentance isn't preached. And, and the doctrine of remission, which is favored among the so-called evangelicals that are middle left. Of course, for you, middle left. Anyway. <clears throat> is not the message that our forebears preached in the colonial period through the great preacher George Whitefield and all those guys down through history, Jonathan Edwards, and so many others whose names we don't know, Shubal Stearns, uh, some great Baptist preachers, they preached repentance. And they preached it hard and they preached it clear. And where I'm going with this is we have a lot of people who name the name of Christ, but they are doers of iniquity. I would almost be willing to bet you. But I'm not going to. So don't come and try to take me up on it later. But just to make the point. That these people over here in Georgia. Who are committing this voter fraud. Would call themselves Christians. Yeah. I would I'd be willing to bet you. If I talk to that individual. In Florida. Who's been doing this over and over and over again. If I asked her. Are you a Christian? She'd probably say yes. I have a lot of southern preachers who are my friends and they'll be among the first to tell you it's a disaster in the south right now. It's an absolute disaster. Not that it's so great here. <laughs> We've got our problems, amen. California, good night. You talk about the land of the fruits and the nuts. Yikes. I mean, we've just got all kinds of issues here, so please don't misunderstand me. But we used to depend on the on the Bible belt to kind of keep the country tracking toward conservative 
biblical Christian values. It's no longer there for us. So what we need is revival in this country. We need God's people to wake up to the true gospel. Now you know, many of you, that we at this church sponsor something called a gap conference where we call pastors to come in. We get about 30 to 40 pastors who come together and we feed them and, and so on. And that's why they come. They come to eat, lose, lose tri-tip. So we, we kind of, you know, seduce them in with lose tri-tip and then we preach at them. That's not true. They're here because they have they share our they share our values and our concerns. But we get together and we're talking about some of these issues. Pray about this upcoming conference in, this, in March 2019 because we're going to focus on this issue. What's happened to old path preaching? The influence of contemporary culture upon preaching style and preaching content. And in what ways has pressure from the world to dampen down our preaching style? In what, uh, uh, to what extent has that also impacted preaching content? Because so many of the guys say, well, you know, we don't get the storming, you know, hellfire, damnation, preaching. We just don't do that anymore. We, but but we, we are preaching the same message. And I'm asking them, are you really? Let's look at the message you're preaching today and compare it to the message you, you preached back then when you were pounding your pulpits and ripping and snorting and busting your britches. I, those are exaggerations. Nobody actually ever did any of that. I'm just saying, you know, making a point. That preaching used to be a lot more passionate and hot, and now it's gotten very, I don't know. You don't have to scream and yell to make your point. I know that. I'm just curious as to how much has the influence of the world in terms of how it's caused so many preachers in their pulpits today to, mo to, to modify their approach, their pulpiteering. How much of that has bled over into also modifying the content of their message? Because it has happened. Not that if you change the style, therefore content's restored. Just restore the content. I don't care about style, to be perfectly honest with you. I can care less about style. I've just noticed something. And let me, let me explain it to you. If a preacher is responding to pressure of the world, hey, you ought not to raise your voice. If he's responding to the pressure of the world on those things, is he also responding to the pressure of the world of don't preach on hell? Don't preach so hard on repentance. And the answer to the question is yes, that's exactly what's happening. A lot of pastors are not, they will not go to their pulpit and just lay it out on abortion. Now we've seen some things change over the years, haven't we? Many of us were very concerned about Billy Graham as much as we loved him that he would not come out and just preach a rip-snorting message against abortion, the murder of babies in the womb. He just wouldn't do it. He'd make, you know, relatively soft comments about it <clears throat> from time to time, but he would never really just take a stand on that or on homosexuality or some of these other things. His son, however, yeah, Frankie, I appreciate it. Amen. Some of you aren't paying attention. No, oh, Franklin Graham's out there laying it down, man. I mean, he, he in a recent message, he just laid it out there. So I don't know how you can be a Christian and support uh, people who kill babies in the womb. Wow. See, because that's the, that's what happens in this pulpit. You know, I mean, right right all along the way. I mean, we've we've never changed, but that's the way it used to be everywhere in a church like ours. But even churches like ours are beginning to lose their moorings and drift off. And that's what this Gap Conference is all about. It's kind of like calling the young men to wake up, pay attention. Don't get seduced by these fellas, the Joel Olsteins and those Rick Warrens and those, that crowd. Be careful about those guys. Because they, they, they have large ministries and they look very successful, but you can be a very successful failure. <laughs> right? I mean, anybody who's read Revelation chapters 2 and 3 know that the last church had better numbers than any of them. It was richer than any of them. It was probably larger than any of the others. 
It was also the one that Jesus said, I'm going to spit you from my mouth. It's the one that disgusted him more. And that's saying something when you have churches like Thyatira with Jezebel teaching in the church the people to commit fornication. And I'm not by comparison justifying that one. He was angry with them too. But he comes to this church and he has nothing to say to them about rank heresy. But he has something to say to them about the fact that they were rich, they were prosperous, all this kind of stuff, but they were lukewarm. I think we have a lot of lukewarm Christianity going on. 